Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from London, my dear friends all over the world. And thank you so much for joining this uh, exciting webinar. My name is Prakadas Gupta. I'm based uh, in Guy's Hospital, King's College, London. It is uh, 5.30 here in the afternoon, 6.30 p.m. Uh, Central European time. And uh, it is my real pleasure uh, to host this Euro webinar on behalf of the European School of Urology as one of its uh, board members. We wanted to go really international uh, and invite colleagues from the United States. This webinar is about a new robot in the new era of new robotics. And this robot is already here, although not yet in Europe. The machine I'm speaking about is Intuitive Surgical's SP or single port robot, which got its FDA approval in November, 2018. I know many of you are waiting for this new machine, and I'm told that it'll have C marking in Europe and also in South America pretty soon. I wanted to thank Intuitive Surgical for supporting this webinar. And I will now hand over to Dr. Marcio Moskovas, who is Dr. Vipul Patel's associate at the Advent Health Global Robotics Institute in Florida. As many of you know, this is the center which has performed more robotic assisted radical prostatectomies. I now believe close to 18,000 of these operations than any other institute in the whole world. We are really privileged to have Marcio with us because he is one of the main authors of most of the publications on SP robotics that have come out of Vipul Patel School. Vip, unfortunately, has had a major family problem this afternoon and I'm very grateful that Marcio has stepped in. I can guarantee you he will not disappoint. Marcio, over to you. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prokar. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here on European School of Urology, talking to a lot of uh, people worldwide uh, with uh, some good friends, Kauk, Prokar. And I'm going to talk a little bit here about our experience with the SP. Um, so this is a robot that we have here. I have no disclosures. Uh, um, this is a robot that we have here since 2019. And over here, you can see all this uh, timeline of robotic surgery um, since the 80s. Uh, the first concept of robotic surgery done in, um, in the defense department, the first uh, clearance uh, by the FDA in 2000, and then all the units until the last unit uh, clear in November 2018 um, by FDA. So that's the single port and all these robots, you're very familiar with that since the first uh, unit with three arms until the last one. And what's the, the main, uh, what's the main difference of this one? You can see all of them are multi-port, the first unit with three arms, the, 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 the other units with four arms. So this one, it's only one arm, one incision, one or two incision, and all instruments are going inside. And we've been talking in a lot of places all, all, all around the world. And those are pretty much the most common questions that people ask us uh, when they're talking about the SP. So costs, what about the instruments? And in which patients are we performing? Some limitations, uh, XI or SP. And we always tell them to have a lot of cautions with comparisons. And I will, I will let you guys know why. Um, you see, it's a totally different machine. It's an impressive technology. It's a great machine. Uh, of course, all, all instruments are coming through one throker. So they, those are six millimeters instruments with an oval shaped camera. Um, all of them are bi-articulated. And this oval shaped camera it has one centimeter. So all instruments are going out from one throker uh, with 2.5 centimeters. So it's pretty tiny space. And for now, as 
Professor Proker was talking about, we have only in the United States, uh, Korea and uh, Taiwan. Um, they're planning to do the clearance in Europe and South America. We don't know when yet, but um, they're working on it. It will be a fantastic thing. And this is a video that we have. It's a, 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 the company's video and you see the technology, all the articulations, the instruments. And I want you to pay attention in this moment. All instruments coming out of the choker, you see the length that they can, they have to reach to open to have their optimal work. And so you need to, you need at least 20 to 25 centimeters uh, uh, distance from the working uh, spots to have this optimal opening. So it's a pretty uh, um, a fantastic technology with all the, the settings that they develop in, the, in this robot. You can work uh, up, up, upside down with the scope on six degrees and tiny and little holes like a tennis ball. And we've been doing a lot of research all these years uh, since 2019 that when we, we got the robot for the first time. Uh, we've been talking a lot of research. We've been doing a lot of research. And, if you have a look at the literature, we have a pretty robust uh, literature on the, the SP. So procedures done in cadavers, like dozens of procedures, all types of urologic procedures done uh, in cadavers. And then uh, after that, they did a lot of procedures in humans. So cystectomies, prostatectomies, nephrectomies, all types of procedures as well uh, through this uh, uh, three and a half years of clearance. And but radical prostatectomy is the main procedures, the most important and the the, the highest uh, number of procedures done in in the urology. And when we see these numbers, when we see all these uh, papers that I put uh, previously, uh, we have more than forty studies, more than one thousand patients operated on uh, uh, on this robot. Uh, I'm talking about a uh, radical prostatectomy, and we see the operative time, console time, blood loss, intraoperative, and all, all the all the variables around this this surgery. And it's pretty common to try to compare with this the multiport. Uh, so everybody that see this the, these numbers, they try to input some comparisons. They try to do some. Uh, uh, different approaches to see uh, which one is better and all that. And we always tell them to kind of uh, uh, be careful with this, this type of comparisons. Why? Because we have different choker placements. Uh, we have pure single port, single port plus one. We have uh, por uh, port placements with gel point with the now the new intuitive uh, um, material that they provide. We have different axes, transperitoneal, experitoneal, hatsus bearing, transvesical, perineal. We have different surgical techniques. You're gonna see through the literature that each center has a different uh, uh, technique to approach this type of surgery. We also have different post-operative protocols done in these different uh, centers. And most studies, they're including some outcomes during the learning curve. So be careful while comparing this with the multiport. Those are two different machines to do that, okay? This is one of the first studies we've done uh, two and a half years ago. Uh, talking about everything that we, we passed through, we've been through while building our program here. And this includes like um, the selection criteria that we use and we're still using this uh, selection criteria. Some centers, most centers, they're not using, but over here in Celebration, we're doing a select, uh, selection criteria. Uh, we don't do salvage. We try to get a prostate uh, with less than 60 grams, uh, thin patients. We don't do salvages with this, um, this procedure. I any procedure that needs some more traction, those are the ones that we're not using the SP. So that's one of the limitations of this robot, it's the traction. When you apply a, a traction for big prostates or big uh, um, organs, it won't work as that XI. We're all also talking about our learning curve, the working distance. Now you're working a little, it's, it's a little different than the multiport because Remember when I showed you the difference uh, 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 when they deploy the instruments, you need to, to work a little bit further, a little bit far away from the, the site, a little bit different than the multiport. The different angles, especially the nurse bearing, how we're doing the nurse bearing, we, we don't have the wrists uh, in this robot. So the way that we're doing the, the nurse bearing, we use a lot of wrist to do that. 
and we all, of course, we're describing our uh, radical prostatectomy technique. This is this is a uh, one uh, nice feeder that we won awards over there at AUA. So it's uh, on internet on YouTube if you want to 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 have a look at more details about the the single port. This also it's an open access um, that we did in our journal of urology, talking all the different. Uh, uh, um, challenges that we had during this process and how we're doing our technique. It's an atlas, of course. And over here, you can see the comparison between both uh, consoles, okay? They're pretty much the same. You see in this picture that you have an extra pedal. We don't have that anymore, but that's the first, the very first version that we did. And we had an extra pedal. Over here, all arrow, all these arrows that you're seeing, uh, it's a point of articulation. So you see that this robot is very, uh, um, good for different quadrants. So because you have all different types of articulation in one machine and the round uh, um, yellow thing here, it's where we dock the, the port. The technique that we use here, we're still using in, um, in our center is the single port plus one. So we put one uh, choker 20 centimeters away from the pubis uh, with a two and a half, three centimeter incision done in Hasson's technique and assistant choker. The main rationale of using the assistant choker, we avoid losing time. So we have this, we still have the assistant there uh, doing the suction, putting the clips, and we believe that this uh, uh, saves us um, some time during the procedure. And that's the choker placed. So 2.5 to three centimeters, Hasson's technique. And then we put the assistant port with uh, air seal under vision. And this is the choker placement. After doing the central choker, we put the, the assistant choker, just no, no big deal, like we're doing in all multi-port uh, uh, surgeries. And after that, we put uh, in a 26th uh, Trindelenburg position. And we need to take care and be careful over here because while angling this robot, we can, uh, um, we can hit the patient's face. So the assistant must be very uh, careful over there to do like a little burp to lift this, uh, this kind of uh, back part of the robot. And this is the final aspect in the patient. Uh, we don't use a gel point. We don't use the intuitive uh, uh, um, uh, this positive, the uh, the new the, the the one that looks like a ball. We don't we don't use that one. Uh, we put the choker straight forward in the skin, and this is the docking. You're gonna see that it's really easy to dock. As soon as you have the the all chokers placed, you're gonna you just need to position, align the the instrument, uh, the robot with the the instrument, and that's it. And then you press with your thumb. Over there, and then you're gonna see a blue light uh, showing that the the robot is docked. Yeah, we're done. And then we just angle the robot with one of those buttons that I already showed, and then we put the instruments in under vision. We start with the camera. We use the camera uh, at twelve o'clock position, and then we put all the instruments: cardiac, bipolar, and scissors. All of them under visualization. It's a pretty, uh, it's straightforward robot. As soon as you have the, the chokers placed and you just um, put the robot and then insert the instruments. And that's the final view uh, that we have. So Cartier, bipolar and scissors. That's the, the sequence that we use. And this is a, an interesting picture showing the choker. This is pretty much the choker inside a patient. So the yellow line is where the skin will be. And that's the distance that we need to have to do it, um, to have the deployment, that, that initial video that I showed you. And what's the main rationale of using the uh, gel point or the intuitive uh, uh, um, access kit is that you can do this uh, instruments, all this deployment outside of the patient's body. So you can have more, more space inside. So this is really good to do extra peritoneal access because you're going to have to do a super uh, uh, infra umbilical incision. So you need uh, at least some more space to kind of deploy these instruments. As I showed you, this is the final uh, positioning of our instruments in our techniques. And this is an interesting uh, view. So you can see that as soon as you put all instruments, you can switch the middle one to the left or to the side to work if one uh, with 
two instruments on the left side or instruments or two instruments on the right side. This navigation is really important because this is where, especially in the learning curve at the beginning, when, when you're kind of learning how to position your arms and your, your, your scope, this is really important to put you in, a, 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 to avoid a clashing between the arms. Because sometimes you have the camera under one arm, the other arms cross. So during the learning curve, this is a really, uh, important. This is the relocation pedal. We don't have that anymore. So what we used to do, we used to press this pedal and then you're going to see a yellow uh, square around my, my screen here. This is where we kind of locate the robot to another quadrant. So we don't do that anymore. We don't use this pedal anymore. We kind of press the camera and then we turn the, the camera as a, a, a car engine. And then you rotate the robot to the side or to the quadrant that you want to do. So this is a, a study that we did comparing both uh, approaches. You can see that in terms of size and the tower and everything, they're pretty much the same. The SP is a little bit smaller, of course, because you only have one choker. And we compare two groups. So what we did, we, we got the first 71 patients that we did with SP. And then we did a propensity score match uh, among 1,500 patients that we operated on the same time with the XI. And they had a short uh, uh, follow-up. And then what we saw, uh, intraoperative outcome complications and short-term outcomes as well. So the on the left side, the multi-port, that's pretty much what every, everybody does uh, with one or two assistants. And uh, on the right side, the single port, as I previously showed um, our technique. And this camera is really interesting because we're taping on the side of the of both robots. So you see on the left side, the XI very independent arms, while uh, on the right side, you have the SP. So they kind of work together. They're coordinating the movements together. It's really interesting. And that's why you should learn how to do the camera because you see the camera is still on the top and the arms are working around it. So you need a learning curve to do that. Otherwise you're gonna work with your arms on top of your camera and, and vice versa. So that's the, the difference between them. That's another learning curve that we're gonna have. And here I'm gonna show the comparison in, in all steps in our radical prostatectomy, the, how the, the instruments work and all the, the, the main angles that we need. You see the anterior bladder next, they work pretty much the same, exactly the same. So we open the anterior bladder neck and then we go inside to assess the posterior. But you see every time that we do the traction on the SP on the right side, the prostate kind of comes down a little bit because of the traction that this robot provides. You see the X side has more strength. So that's one of the reasons that we're doing the, the, the selection criteria over here. We, you don't have to, as I said, most centers are not doing anymore, but we do. And here the seminal vesicles, they work pretty much the same with a good, uh, a good um, um, working space as well. We're still using the clips to see our assistant going uh, with the clips. We don't burn the, the, um, the seminal vesicles. We don't burn the pedicles. We just go with uh, uh, our, the main clips that we always used. Yeah, the second half here, you have the seminal vesicles on the top. And then we're doing the, the nerve sparing, the posterior approach between the denovillier layers. You see on the on the left side, the, S, the XI, um, we use the wrist movements here to achieve the angles that we want to do during the nerve sparing. We don't have that with the, with the SP, but this is something that you can kind of compensate if you put your camera on the six o'clock position, we use at 12 because we like pretty much how we, we're doing in all cases, but you can do on the six to try to look up. Now the lateral fascia, we open a little bit the, the endopelvic fascia, we still open with both robots. We try to, re when we built the SP program here, we try to reproduce exactly what we're doing with the XI on the SP. Well, of course, some exceptions and some modifications due to the robot 
Um, but there, we're pretty much doing the same uh, uh, job with both robots here. So uh, we isolate the, the pedicles after opening the endopelvic fascia, and then we're going to clip the pedicles. You see that they work pretty much the same, exactly the same, despite the posterior part, that, uh, as I previous, previously said. Yeah, this is the posterior view. The, when we're trying to assess the posterior view, that's another learning curve because it's a different uh, angle that we need to achieve with the instruments and with the camera as well. Uh, as I said, we try to go from 12 o'clock and then look under the prostate. Some surgeons they're doing with a six o'clock pos position, something that I always say on, on the SP, there's no right or wrong. That's, that's the way that you're doing, you know? Um, Again, now we're going to the apical dissection. They work exactly the same over here. You see the bipolar and cutting with the scissors. And after that, we kind of isolate the prostate from the DVC and then we suture, we do a running suture in the DVC. Now the suturing part, they're pretty much they have a good suturing, a little different, something that we need to, to learn as well, because on the X side, you have the wrist movement. So you kind of use your wrist. And over here, you have an elbow and a shoulder, and you, you need to adapt that. But this is, an, this is not a big deal, to be honest. This is one of the easiest part to learn with the SP. And now we kind of separate the urethra. We use the same uh, technique as the posterior reconstruction with the Roku stitch. And you see the how it works with, uh, with the suturing. It's pretty good as well. Again, over here, we use a quill, quill two O's in all our sutures with the SP and with uh, uh, an X side. A quill for the reconstruction and a quill of... Uh, a bidirectional, a bidirectional suture here, also with a quill with the two needles. And you see that it does a, a really good job during the suturing, but this is another learning curve when you're migrating from the XI to the SP. And finally, we have the anastomosis. This is a lateral view uh, shot that we did. So you see the relationship between both arms and the camera. Uh, every step, you're going to have to adjust your camera, adjust your arms. You don't have that uh, uh, concept that we have in the multiport that you forget your fourth arm over there and then you work with the other ones that you have. No, this one you need to reposition all the time if you want to traction, if you want to have a better uh, understanding of the tissue plans. And in our conclusion, this study, we had uh, less blood loss, like 20 mLs, 20 cc's uh, less blood loss. We find increased uh, console time and total operative time. Pretty much of this, uh, because of these ad adaptations that we did, all this uh, kind of modifications that we did in terms of traction. We didn't find any difference in pain scores. Over here, we tried to assess a pain score at 6, 12, and 18 hours after surgery. So all patients answer for a answer a questionnaire about the pain. And we couldn't find any difference over here. And of course, we need a long-term follow-up to evaluate functional and oncological outcomes. That's the paper on that time. Now we see that the, the continence rates of the SP and the XI, they're pretty much uh, in our center, they're pretty, pretty much similar like almost 90%. And the oncological outcomes we're still evaluating. Um, another question that everybody does is cost. When we're doing a cost analysis, so we used the same court. We did a propensity score, 71 patients, and we evaluated the cost between uh, among both uh, trokers. And at the end, we saw that the cost, the difference between the, the disposables, the instruments, and everything was $700. 
And you, this can increase if you use a gel point or access kit. But some papers after that uh, showed us that if you're doing an early discharge protocol, uh, if you're kind of working in this uh, the discharge of the patient early discharge, we can have a pretty much similar uh, uh, procedures of XI and SP in terms of cost. And finally, this is another paper that we did um, talking about the learning curve, the importance of their learning curve during this, the importance of this selection criteria, especially during the learning curve, so we could maintain our positive margins, of course, a little bit uh, um, with an increase in the operative time, and we could maintain our positive margins constant through this 100 case by selecting patients. So doing patients that are T2, small prostates, non-invasive cancers. So selecting this patient, especially during the learning curve, the learning curve we kind of uh, adopted here to 17 to 25 cases. That's pretty much what we, what we think here, doing some analysis. And, but after that, by doing this uh, uh, selection criteria, we still kept the same uh, positive, um, the positive surgical margins rates. And one thing that uh, we, we think that it's a really good benefit of this robot, it's in patients with uh, intra-abdominal obst obstacles. So this patient had an ileostomy and a rectal amputation. Uh, we couldn't access the right side of this patient because everything, the ileostomy was on the right side and we couldn't place the trokers there. So we went straight toward to the SP. We did a XP, uh, an open as access. We did a XP, SP approach with the uh, assistant port on the, on the other side. And we, we didn't have any problems on that. And finally, this is the biggest um, comparison in the literature, but this is not a... XI with the SP. Those are SP patients, extra peritoneal versus transperitoneal SP patients. So this what in our concept, it makes more sense now for what we have. We don't have a randomized trials to compare both robots. So we're comparing among the SP cores. That's what makes more sense in terms of outcomes. And what we have over here is that we have a, uh, with the extra peritoneal, we had an increased uh, operative time pretty much for doing the space and everything. Um, the hospital length of stay was shorter with the extra peritoneal. And the pain, the pain scores and the complication rates if were pretty much similar. We could not uh, uh, see any difference in this study, but this is a great study because it's from the SPARC consortium. So all the big uh, um, surgeons and all referral centers in the SP, uh, we did, we combine our data and we try to see what we, what we can, uh, what we, we can do in terms of improvements and everything. So it was a really interesting and exciting study. Uh, in summary, the SP summary, uh, it's based on retrospective studies. It's feasible and safe with low rates of intraoperative complications. We have a lot of confounding factors, as I said in the literature. Uh, we only have short-term outcomes. And while we are comparing this uh, robots, that's the pretty much the the picture that we see that we want to put both in battles to see which one is better. But I don't think that's their approach when we're talking about these robots. Uh, they're pretty much a complementary to each other. We think that SP will be the future in this next generation, the second, the third generation. So that's the picture that I want you guys to keep in your mind. Um, we see benefits in patients with multiple surgeries, abdominal obstacles, pediatric, pediatric approach, heteroperitoneal kidney with small spaces and only one choker. And this is our website if you want to have some more videos. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Marcio. Uh, there is a question which has been answered from Hank van der Poel, our friend uh, from uh, Amsterdam. Uh, being so close, how to clean the lens quickly? Presumably, you already overcame that learning curve. How to clean the lens quickly? Uh, I mean, it's only the assistant there for us, to be honest. So if we have any any issue there, he removes and clean it and then put it over. Uh, uh, unless uh, Professor Jihad has something, some new tricks there, 
He has some yeah, tricks. He has some I tricks. I want to know if he has something. He always has something new in, new in the webinars. Will, Every time when I'm going to talk to him, he has something new. So it will no, be he, good to learn. <laughs> his trick is to do SP through the through here. Yeah? So yeah. no <laughs> lens required. Look, the other question <laughs> is from Koryun uh, Mizoyan. How many manipulations can the SP camera be used? Uh, presumably, I mean, the camera has doesn't have a shelf life, right? It can, you can use it for thousands of cases. Yeah, yeah, you can use, I don't have this number on the top of my head, to be honest, but um, in our contract, you can use it. We don't have this limitations of like 50 cases, 100 cases, 500. We can use it until it's it's working. Okay, fantastic, fantastic talk. And please stay with us because- Sure. We'll hook you in on the discussions afterwards. It's my great pleasure then to uh, welcome uh, the single port man himself. I mean, uh, Dr. Jihad Kauk heads up uh, robotics and innovation at Cleveland Clinic, but Jihad and I go back 20 years, don't we, Jihad? Very close links between the Cleveland Clinic and my own hospital guys. We have both been to each other's institutions. And, you know, I've tried snake heads. Jihad has used the old Vespa system. I remember hosting him at the AUA a few years ago where he was doing single port robotic cystectomy through the perineum with a gel point. I mean, uh, there were gasps of disbelief. Uh, someone asked, how do you do a lymph node dissection in a cystectomy through the perineum? Anyway, to tell us more, and particularly Jihad, I want to know whether the single port transperineal prostatectomy is the least invasive and best uh, uh, prostatectomy that we can give to our patients. But really, you are the man who has made all this possible. So tell us more about single port robotic prostatectomy. Over to you, Jihad. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Prokar, for your kind uh, invitation and kind introduction, uh, as always. Uh, yes, we go back uh, a long way together for more than 20 years uh, where I did visit Dr. Dasgupta uh, in London and get to know about the amazing work he does. He actually inspired me um, in terms of research and clinical outcomes and the innovations that uh, he continued to produce. Um, it's a pleasure to be uh, joining my colleague, uh, uh, Marcio. Uh, we've heard the, the talks before uh, together and uh, and uh, it will be a pleasure here to uh, give uh, my perspective on single port. Um, I will get to your answer about the perineal uh, procar during the presentation. It will be easier for me to demonstrate. So these are my disclosures. And um, I would like to start by saying that for those of you who think that the single port will be presented as another big step in minimal invasive surgery, I think they need to rethink again. The big step from open to laparoscopy decreased the morbidity significantly for patients. And then moving from laparoscopy to robotics increased the precision of what we do big time. But moving to the single port, the mindset, in my opinion, should be small steps, increments of small advancements that they add up to make a big difference. You will not find one thing you will do that you will say, hey, that's huge. It will be minor, small thing. One at a time may not be significant, but when you add them together, you will start seeing a difference for the patients. Single port is not new, you know, from laparoscopy with the multiport back in 2007, many of us tried the single port laparoscopically. It failed. Why it failed? Because we had one, the wrong instruments. So they were rigid instrument, clashing, ergonomics, that did not work. So we tried the robot. The robot provides better ergonomics. We used the multiport robot to do single port. Still we failed. Why did we fail? We failed because the mindset was wrong. The why is more important than the how. And the why was wrong when we were in 2008 doing single port. 
we were thinking of how can we translate what we do with multi-port, translate it to single port. Everything the same. Everything the same except one cut versus multiple cut. What was the advantage? Maybe cosmesis. We increased the risk of hernia and it did not work. So why do we think this time it will work? We believe that the mindset should be right. It's not about a one incision versus multiple. It's about regionalizing the surgery to the disease. If you can use a low profile robot to regionalize select cases that you do or select procedures, then we may be looking at advancing the needle. So for instruments, robots keep evolving. The latest generation of the single port robot, you saw Marcio presenting fantastic external footage that makes my job easier since you, for those of you who don't know the robot, that was an excellent view. But again, applying single port for a new innovation to stick on and, uh, and be beneficial, it has to bring value. It's not about the one incision. It's not about replacing or comparison with the multi-port. It's about selecting your approach, a custom-made approach to your procedures. So this robot is low profile. Fantastic. How can we use it to regionalize the surgery? I'll give you examples. So we know now that this robot come from a cannula. It's about two and a half centimeter in diameter. The camera is fully wristed. The instruments are double jointed and you have a navigator at the bottom of the screen that tells you where your instruments are in relation to each other. This is the cannula. You can again demonstrate here, you know how you can go in narrow areas, narrow as much as tunneling under the skin. Like my colleagues in general surgery are doing nipple sparing mastectomies from an incision in the axilla or thyroid from different areas that are not visible. So what was one big advancement that we did towards regionalization? And that was one of the questions today on this webinar. You're working too close to the field. The camera is gonna be smudged frequently. You can't work in shallow places. That is not true. So before, you know, initially, Intuitive presented a cannula that you put in a gel port or whatever, and you do the surgery very close to your field. You need 20 centimeters to spread your instruments well and use your joints to do the procedure. So we published uh, three years ago on something we call the floating duct technique, where you can see the, uh, on the right side of the screen, we put the port in a way that the tip of the robot hovers on top of the patient. You're not even inside the patient with the robot, but you're in, you're in within that port system that keeps the pressure for you. And then you send your instruments. So no matter how shallow the patient, the youngest single port I've done is actually nine month old child. There are some pediatric applications that are perfect for single port, like pyeloplasty from a mini fan and steel incision down in the pelvis on a crease. So how do you do that in shallow areas? Move the robot out of the patient within a port system. You can look at that paper. It's called the floating duct technique. It made what I'm going to present to you possible, actually. In the floating duct, we did some studies, and we found that we can increase the volume, your surgical volume, in a narrow area by about almost 400%. Four folds, you can increase your surgical field by moving the robot out and hover it. And I'm not gonna go into all the different fields and potential that the single port can be used. We've done more than 700 cases in our center. And yes, we have evolved. So we've done not just simple cases, we've done kidney transplant. Why kidney transplant? It's been done robotically. We moved it a step further. We do them now routinely extra peritoneal to mirror the gold standard open transplant. While all the known today robotic transplant is, got, is done transperitoneal, and you can imagine when you apply it for the obese patient, the bowel in the way, and all this, 
plus the risk of hernias. Then we came to the transvesical prostatectomy. And then I will show you even more partial prostatectomy. Then I'll tell you since we get the gas bubble to be regionalized inside the bladder only, we do not even insufflate the abdomen at all. So now we do some cases with the patient awake under epidural anesthesia. For certain cases, the patients don't even take a muscle relaxant during the case. So for select patient, for the custom make approach, this can serve more patients better. I'm going to skip this uh, slide that shows all the various applications we've done at our center using the single port. And yes, cystectomy is one of them, not the perineal. The perineal, these are lab work, uh, lab perineal cystectomy uh, is a concept that we keep exploring and uh, challenging the field. But we did clinically uh, cystectomies for patients using single port with intracorporeal diversions. Again, this is not about single port with, with additions. And why is it important? I mean, initially, it's not important if we're in a learning curve or, or want to establish a field. But later, I think it is important. Remember what I said about increments of tiny, small steps to add up. And it's not okay in my mind to add more ports because you're limiting your application and then you're adding you know, more incisions. So let's talk prostate. Custom make approach for the prostate. For 20 years, robotic prostatectomy meant going transperitoneal, putting the patient in steep, trendy lumbar to get the gravity, pull the bowel out of the way, and then do the surgery with minor chain modifications, 20 years. Now we have the option of going perineal, transvesical, transperitoneal, you do risia sparing, you have multiple options in your hands. So you need, we need to start custom making the approach to our patient if we want to get that patient that extra step of less invasive approach. Let's zoom into the transvesical approach. Transvesical approach is not about doing the same, you know, um, uh, patients that we would have done otherwise or, or selecting the simple procedures. We're talking of patients like these examples here. These are patients with horrible abdomens, frozen pelvises, multiple surgeries. We have one of our largest experience in J-Pouch patient who underwent transvesical radical prostatectomy, almost 50 patients that we accumulated in less than two years. Patients come from all over the United States. Why? Because we can go transvesical. I don't see any of the scar tissue. I'm working through the bladder. And most of these patients went home the same day within three hours after surgery. So this is the kind of improvement that we are excited about this new innovation for. It's not that we are doing another approach using yet another robot. I'm not that interested in the tool, the robot itself. I'm interested into the details of decreasing the morbidity. Steps of the surgery, plus or minus are the same, but look at the small increments I was talking about before. The patient is flat, no trendy lumbar. That means patients with COPD, ventilating the patient, glaucoma, intraocular pressure, even just the general feeling of the patient not having congestion post-op adds to our ability to discharge the patient home within three hours after surgery. So how do we do it? So we make an incision about two to three centimeter, just below the belly button, above the pubic bone, fill the bladder, check that we are at the bladder, same as you would do a suprapubic uh, tube insertion. And here is the incision in the bladder. Then you put the port straight into the bladder. You don't go to the abdomen, you don't go anywhere in the patient, except straight skin, fascia, bladder, and then you dock that robot. And once the robot is docked, this is a, a new version of the port. It's a bubble port. It allows you to put your port straight in the bladder. You can see through a cystoscopic view what I'm talking about. These are, this is the camera 
and the three other instruments. We use a configuration where uh, you will see I use the uh, lower six o'clock port. I use it for my suction. When you put the robot straight in the bladder, it's as if you're doing also a cystoscopy on the patient. So you can predict or, or uh, know exactly what you're gonna be dealing with, different median lobes, previous surgeries, a bladder neck contracture like in this patient, stones that it takes a minute to remove the stone or diverticuli that you want to treat on your way to doing the prostatectomy. In one case, we even saw a bladder tumor just before we started, this would have been totally missed if we were doing the conventional way. We were able to uh, cut it, uh, you know, uh, through the muscle and uh, and burn the place uh, of its site. This is the first view you will see when the robot is in. You're looking at the base of the prostate from the first minute. You can see the urethral orifices so that you can avoid them. You make an incision through the full thickness of the bladder. You go posterior to the bladder, lift the vas and the seminal vesicle. You will need to suction for yourself. You can see the suction that I'm using this blue tip. It's a flexible suction. It actually gives me control to where I want to be. So these are both vasi being cut. Then I will get to the uh, denonvier, prepare the medial aspect of the nerve, and then I stop. I skip the vascular pedicle, go anteriorly, and then I dissect the apical area of the prostate. After that, I come back to the vascular pedicle. Why? Because now I have dissected above and below the vascular pedicle and the nerve. So I have more landmarks to peel the nerves off. In our uh, early series, where this is one of the movies there, I will suture the dorsal vein and, and then get to the urethra. Nowadays, I don't even open the endopelvic fascia I don't cut the dorsal vein or even suture the dorsal vein. And here is the urethra being preserved, the prostate delivered inside the bladder. Lymph node dissection, as you can see, can be done because you can move your instruments, but caution that these are very limited lymph node dissection. So if the patient have a brigand score that is low, then you can do sampling of the obturator lymph node. But if you need more, we use extra peritoneal approach rather than the transvesical. This is what I call the rocostomosis. So I start with the stitch from the back to approximate my anastomosis. And then I go through the bladder mucosa and continue with the same suture to do the uh, urethral uh, vesicle suturing on one side, another needle for the other side, and then circumferentially untie them at 12 o'clock. We use VLOC or barbed sutures on an RB1 needle or something similar. And here's the completion of the uh, uh, transvesical radical prostate with limited lymph node dissection. This is the sample. These are patients who've had a lot of scar tissue before from previous surgeries. And this is the incision there. Again, nothing about cosmesis here. We avoided the scar tissue in these patients completely. We have low positive margin. Most of them are limited. Only one patient so far in the last two years have had biochemical recurrence in a patient who didn't have positive margin to start with. So when we talk about trifecta, we usually talk about negative margin, uh, urinary continence uh, coming back quick, uh, potency recovery, and the trifecta varies. We want to raise the bar. It's not enough to tell me that we have good outcome at six months with 98% continence rate. What is the time to continence? How many pads the patient used for how long till they get really dry? That's what we are interested in uh, now is how much uh, pain and suffering the patient had to endure to get to an excellent result. That's the question now we raise the bar and instead of asking in six months how the excellent outcomes would be. So from our transvesical approach, we found that 91% of our patients went home within three to four hours after surgery. So these patients don't have even a hospital bed reserved for them. So this hospital bed is used for another surgery, increasing 
the revenues, but more important, touching a new life, doing more surgeries with the same number of beds for our patients. Only 5% take narcotics. 95% don't use any narcotics at all in this procedure. Foley catheter half the time, three days instead of seven days and we remove it. Continence, 50% of our patients have immediate continence. And this is something we've not seen in any approach except Rizia sparing. But remember Rizia sparing, although it shortened time to continence, still you go with the same morbidity profile of the transperitoneal approach and the trendy lumbar position. Here, you are sending this patient in three to four hours home because you're avoiding the bowel, you see no bowel, you touch no bowel, and you keep the patient flat and you make one incision. Uh, so everything is down to the minimum. So you want to be a minimalist in these cases. This is a graph comparing our transvesical with the transperitoneal approach. You will notice that at six months at and one year, both are equally great, above 90% continence. But tell me immediately when the Foley is removed, how are we doing? 49, 50% of the patient don't use any pad at all when we go transvesical. And that's probably because we are very careful with the apical dissection, but also the bladder attachments have something to do. Why I say that? Because in these transvesical cases, that I went and did lymph node dissection. So I kind of uh, uh, weakened the bladder attachment, the time to continence deteriorated and became closer to what I see in the transperitoneal approach. This is the length of stay I was telling you about with an excellent profile of discharging patient home that we're very confident we don't need to reserve a bed, hospital bed for these patients. And pain control, you can see to the right side there, only about 5% of patients have a mix of pain medicine between narcotic and NSAIDs. Most patients take nothing. So do we do transvesical approach for every patient? No, we select our patients. Prostates that are larger than 80 grams to 100 grams, we don't go transvesical. We do extra peritoneal. Patients who have a brigand score of more than 7%, for lymph node involvement, we go extra peritoneal so that we can do an extended lymph node dissection that we cannot do transvesical. Quickly, I'm gonna finish soon. Uh, other applications, just to give you a flavor on what am I talking about, about regionalizing surgery, about the small increments of benefits to the patient that make a big difference. And again, not about the tool, of single port or multi port, not about the one cut or the multiple cuts. So now we're investigating, we've had an early series of going transvesical and doing partial prostatectomy. So those patients who come to us for a focal therapy and they are excluded from the focal therapy because of the obvious reasons like anteriorly located tumor, very large prostate, significant calcification, previous surgery on the prostate, uh, latex allergy, um, all these are excluded automatically from the focal therapy. So what do we do? We go in transvesical where we have access to any portion of the prostate and we can do a lobectomy, you can do a wedge resection, you can do only anterior, and then you put the bladder back together as you can see. We do that all under intra uh, operative real-time imaging of transrectal ultrasound fused with the MRI. And the result is in our first 14 patients was 100% preservation of potency and urine control within one week of surgery. So the first initial small series have been amazing. This is an image here that shows you in the ultrasound the tumor available and then the tumor disappeared uh, while in the surgery still I can do the ultrasound and that uh, marked, digitally marked lesion disappeared before I finished the surgery. Another quick application is the simple prostate. I think the single port transvesical perfect procedure will be simple prostatectomy for very large prostate. I'm talking 200, 300 gram prostate that even the holop may be difficult to do. 
So what do we do with these cases? We go in and take the prostate in multiple pieces. But the other important point I want to make is that here, the surgery in our mind is two steps. Excision, you remove the adenoma, then you reconstruction. You get that mucosa to cover completely your defect. And obviously, primary healing of any wound is quicker and less painful than secondary healing as we do in HOLAP or the traditional way. So now we can really do the surgery without CBI, a continuous bladder irrigation, send the patient home same day, not worry about bleeding or transfusion, and they heal really very quick that we get the catheter out in three days after the procedure. This is my last slide here, and it is to summarize again what's important. Focus on value. So what is the value that single port bring that makes us interested in it? It's value for the patients, decreasing morbidity, like decreasing continence, not wearing pad, uh, discharge home early, no narcotics, and so on. Value for the surgeon, you have multiple options. So you make a custom make approach to your patients. You say, this patient, I'm gonna go extra peritoneal, another patient, I will go uh, transvesical and so on. And value for the health system. You can see that now, even the commuting of the patient in the hospital is like this yellow line, not the dotted line. Patient come to the check-in, they go to the OR, have the surgery, go to the recovery room as any anesthesia uh, routine, then they go back to where they started their morning. If they're feeling well, all good, they go home. So no hospital bed. That did offside the cost significantly for our patients. And we think that on the long term, even cost-wise, this can be a very competitive approach. Thank you for our fellows uh, that allowed uh, me to put all this work in this presentation. Uh, no, this is the engine who make things happen. So I'm always appreciative to the fellows in our program. Thank you so much. And thank you, uh, Prokar, for giving me the opportunity here to be on the stage with you. Jihad, absolutely uh, fabulous. Look, a few questions have uh, cropped up. So if I may uh, shoot them at you for rapid uh, answers. Do you have any problems with calcification on the sutures in the bladder uh, from Luca Penizic? We've not had any so far. You know, that's something we always uh, watch for. We use the, uh, the uh, uh, barred suture that dissolve in 90 days because they also have 180 days. Uh, so you want to use the shorter one. Not so far. We've not had any calcification so far. And then Ramiro Cabello uh, asks, uh, have you had any surgical field hematomas in transvesical SPRP? Do they jeopardize the anastomosis? Uh, any of these problems? You mean intraoperatively? We've not had any intraoperatively because you can suction for yourself, one through the flexible suction and second through the Foley itself. Post-operatively, for patients who needed an MRI or CT scan for whatever reason, there have been small, non-significant hematomas in the surgical field. How do you close the bladder jihad uh, that you enter the port through? Just open simply, surgically? Or? Simply open surgically with a figure of eight. It's like putting a suprapubic tube. Perfect, but you don't put a suprapubic tube. We don't. Oh, I, th I thought about it because some other groups like the Manny Manon group, you know, they don't put a Foley they put a suprapubic and I already have an incision. The reason I don't is because I removed that Foley in three days. So it doesn't make sense to put a suprapubic and cycle you know, the, the urine before I remove it. I think you've already answered this at which insufflation pressure you perform transfer cycle. The answer is zero, isn't that right? So we keep it very low. So because we use the air seal, we never go above 10 to 12. Above 12, you're asking for trouble like air embolus, like subcutaneous emphysema, and so on. So we always stay at about 10 to 12, but we drop it down to five if, when we're doing the anastomosis so that the bladder comes down to the urethra, and you can still see very well. My colleague, Jonathan Noel, uh, who was again uh, uh, with Vipul in Florida, asked, is partial prostatectomy ever preferable with transvesical or extraperitoneal approach, depending on tumor location. So do you yeah. change the approach or do you just go transvesical? 
Yeah, fantastic, uh, you know, question. You know, I can't claim that I'm, uh, I brought the idea of partial prostate. This had been published for uh, since about four or five years, Arnold Villers team, Manny Menon, precision prostatectomy, and so on. This you, this, their approach use multiport. So, but to go multiport, you are really limited. You can only take anterior tumors only, and then you have to deal with the dorsal vein. And then you have the morbidity of going trans, peritoneal and the and this trend lumbar and so on by going transvesical you're avoiding all this and you have the choice because the base of the prostate is like a circle in front of you so you can take out the upper half of the circle the lower half left side or a wedge so it makes it much more effective so final, no uh, final two questions uh, one from the uh, uh, people who have joined us very kindly, over 150 of them. Thank you, chaps. Uh, so, uh, Theodoros Pinos, is the bladder neck preserved during transfer cycle single port robotic prostatectomy? So, the, so initially, you know, I used to think that if I make a bigger incision at the bladder, it's going to affect the time to continence. And I was totally wrong, proven by almost 150 cases we've done so far. We also do post void residue and pressure flow on all our patients before surgery and after each follow up. We have a year and a half follow up to answer the question with our technique are we causing bladder neck contracture? So far, the answer is zero, none and documented by a pressure flow and PVR study. Perfect. Now, Timusin, Sipal, and I have the same question. Is it important to spare the Santorini plexus in the transfer cycle approach? And Jihad, I asked this because I was interested in the uh, perennial approach because there you would spare the Santorini plexus. And as you know, the nerves seem to, at the apex, uh, bifurcate uh, into two, one part goes anteriorly and the other part posteriorly. And by cutting and stitching the Santorini, we end up uh, damaging these uh, nerves. And therefore, it's no wonder we have such high levels of erectile dysfunction despite nerve sparing. So do you think it's important to adapt an approach, as you say, mindset to avoid the Santorini plexus completely? Yeah, you know, I, I continue to do single port perineal prostate for patients who I cannot go through the bladder when the bladder has been shattered for motor vehicle accident or gunshot or so. And I preserve the uh, Santorini plexus. I, I'm now preserving the Santorini plexus anteriorly for the reasons you mentioned, for improving potency and maybe improving even further the continence rate. It seems very appealing because now going through the straight line along the trajectory of the urine from the bladder out, I don't have to look at angles. It's along my, my surgical axis. So if I don't open even the endopelvic fascia without much effort, I will avoid the dorsal vein complex. So that is what came to my attention, but only after I've done a hundred case of transvesical that I shifted now to this approach. And I'm very excited to start comparing and see, did it improve? So hopefully I will be able to answer your very thoughtful question with, with scientific numbers you know, in the next six months. Jihad, Marcio, uh, thank you so much. You've been absolutely fantastic. Thank you for giving up your time in the middle of the day uh, in Florida and Cleveland to uh, be with this international panel. The, the good news is that many of the 150 plus uh, colleagues who joined us were probably somewhere having their midnight or beyond that, and they stayed awake to listen to you. So congratulations, dear friends, for joining this uh, ESU uh, webinar. Again, thank you to Intuitive Surgical. Uh, have a very fine day. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Jihad, Prokar, and everyone.